Hello. Super beautiful sunshine today, and that makes me want to talk about two of the most complicated things at all in the human life. Um, and I have decided to, to talk about both of them today. If you at any point feel that it's too much, or you get provoked too much, or you need a break, then just pause the recording, watch it at a later, later point. It might also be an idea to, to watch it with somebody that you love, somebody you care about, that is going to have your back when, when all these realizations come. There's nothing dangerous in it at all. I mean, it's there already. I'm just pointing the floodlight in that direction so you take a look at it. But it's two of the biggest things that we are struggling with in life. Um, and they're connected. And that's why I would like to talk about them uh, in one teaching uh, together. And also why I want to talk about it on such a beautiful day as we have today. So this one is the, uh, the third lesson in the first feta. And I just want to really reiterate at that it's um, just because it's the first feta does not mean that especially this teaching today doesn't hold any value for you when you are further along. I don't see the fetters as boxes that we move in and out of. It's a circular process. It's like everything else in life. It's that moving wave um, of life that is happening. So what I'm talking about today is just as relevant today as it is when you are further along in your feta work process. So, so far, we have talked about the selfing. You are now aware that you have hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, touching. Those are the senses. And then you have the mind. And the mind is being. However, whenever we think, the mind is thinking. And it's kind of like a crossroad that we are taking. That we are at the point where we have the mind. And if the mind is thinking, the mind is always thinking about something. It always has a topic. It's always about something that needs to be explored or looked into or twisted or turned or something. And the mind is always doing that. The next stop <laughs> is the selfing because thinking is selfing. And selfing is where you put an I in the middle of everything and everything is just evolving around that I, around that ego. So the viewpoint of everything is from the, the selfing and then observing what is happening and uh, assuming what is happening and judging about what is happening. That is the selfing. The other road and the cross crossroad is you have the mind and you have being. And in that you have the same direct purity as you have with seeing, smelling, hearing, tasting and touching. So mind is being. The second thing that you have become aware of so far is that the selfing that you have, where you put yourself in the middle of it, makes you not present. It puts you either in the future or in the past. It's The ego is never here. The ego is never present. That is the being. The ego is always in the past or in the, in the future. So you have expectations about the future. You have regrets about the past. And that makes it very complicated to be in, in a conversation with you because you're never present. You're never there. You are not even questioning what you're hearing. You assume that you hear what the other person is saying. The last exercise that you had in the last lesson, we looked into being present in a conversation and not assuming what you're hearing, but really see, can you ever hear? what the other person is saying or is there always an assumption added to what another person is saying and can you enter a conversation unprepared can you be in a conversation and just being not preparing yourself on what you're gonna reply but just being can you allow silence to be present in a conversation and just see what comes up what evolves in in the silence in the presence with the other person that was the last lesson. If you need to revisit that, then pause right now, go back and listen to the other one. So that is completely settled in you because you need those things settled before we move on to the, uh, to the lesson that we have today. 
Feta work is not about increasing knowledge. It's about decreasing attachment. And I would like to repeat that. It's not about you getting more clever. It's not about you increasing your knowledge. It's about becoming aware of the, of the detachment that you have in your life and decreasing those. And that's feta work. And that's also why we can't put it into boxes because we are all in different places in our lives and our emotional and uh, psychological and biological development. Um, there's some things which you can't talk to a two-year-old or 10-year-old because that those parts of the brain, like reasoning, they're not fully developed yet. So it's not the biological being is not there to actually talk about those things. And it's the same with the psychological being that um, that there's there's some things that that you need to have uh, have insights about before you can have that psychological development. Um, and all that all that creates attachment. And what we're doing with the feather work is decreasing that attachment in looking at what is really there and not what do I assume is there. So feather work is just a way to non-identify in lots of different areas. The metaphor that I'm having in my head when I think about feather work is that you have a huge house and the front door of the house, that is the non-identification. That's like the main theme of everything we talk about. It's non-identification. It's realizing that there is no, there's, there is no I to identify with. There's nothing happening to identify with either. And that doesn't mean that there's, that there is or there's not. It's in the middle between there, which is super, super complicated to understand. But when we get to the sixth feta, I promise I'm going to unravel that one completely for you. So if you imagine this big house that has hundreds of rooms and you have entered, you're now in the hall and there are lots of rooms. Some of the rooms are adjoining rooms and some of the rooms lead to rooms that you've been in previously. That's kind of how how we are as as human beings, that there's some things that we very easily can talk about. Those are the rooms that maybe haven't even got a door <laughs> that you can just enter in, into the room and you've been in any, every single corner and know exactly what is what is where in the room. Everything is placed, you looked at everything. But then there's some rooms that you haven't been into, some rooms that you don't want to go into, some rooms that you know that the room is there, you know the issue is there, but you don't want to look at it, you don't want to go into it. And what some non-duality people do, which I completely understand, I completely understand, it's just completely dismissing and saying there's no house, there's no room, there's no eye, I don't even need to look at it. But that's gaslighting. And the first thing I would like to talk about how to deal with childhood trauma, because pretending that there is no eyes or there's no trauma, it's true, but it's not helpful. It's not helpful at all. If you have issues in your life, something happened and you experienced what happened on that, you created an assumption. If it was childhood traumas, then we, are, we have created a lot of assumptions about things that make sense when our brain wasn't fully developed. And with an adult brain, it doesn't make sense, any sense at all why that could be, you know, fill up so much. Okay, yeah, so Peter stole all my yellow beads when I was sitting and doing a necklace and now I have insecurities. You know, it makes no sense whatsoever. But it's because that the brain wasn't fully developed and we need to, we need to create space for that. That just because it doesn't seem like much now, does not mean that it wasn't a lot at that point. And that's the first thing about trauma. That a lot of rooms we do not enter because we feel it with the emotions that we had, with the emotional capability that we had at the time when Peter stole my yellow beads, you know? And because it feels like so much, I'm not even going into the room. So when we work with trauma, 
in the first fetters, in the first three fetters, then it's all about, first of all, acknowledging that there is something. The next point is kind of like to open the door and accept that there's a lot of things in there. And the last point is understanding what it's all about. And that is the main focus of the first three fetters. It's the acknowledge, accept and understand. I am aware that in LU and also others that work with, with fetter work are not focusing that much on, on the first three fetters. And they say that, that when the first one fall, all of them fall. It's not my experience though. Um, my experience is that there are, there are a lot of things in the light area, and in the light area I mean feelings, that we are dealing with with the first three fetters. And then we get to the heavier area, which is emotions that we deal with in the fourth and the fifth. And let me just clarify and explain the difference. You have a feeling that is coming up and you look at it and it's dissolved. It's like a cloud. There's no attachment to anything. It's just coming and going like a sound or smell that is coming and going. And there's no attachment to it at all. If we attach a selfing to it and you keep cultivating it, like it was, you know, a precious little seed that has been planted, then that is happening. The cultivation that you put into it with the selfing is changing a feeling into an emotion. And when we have an emotion, our body starts to release hormones, which means that you are releasing dopamine or dopamine or uh, adrenaline or norepinephrine or any of those hormones that are, as soon as they're released, starting to shape your personality. And that's why I find it easier and that's why I do it. I'm not saying anybody's doing it wrong or anything because you can't. This is life. You can't do anything wrong. Um, the way that I work with it is that let's untangle all the small knots first, you know, in the periphery. Let's let's look at that first. Let's, let's look at all the feelings first and then see how much is there. Because a lot of the things that we're going to work with in the fourth and the fifth, they're heavy enough on their own. <laughs> There's no need to add to it um, when we can sort out a lot of the things easier in the first three fetters. It also means that when we work with the metaphorically rooms that you're entering, that you acknowledge there's an issue, you open the door into it, and by opening the door into it, you're accepting that it's there, but you do not do anything else. You don't need to do anything at all. Just acknowledging that it's there, opening the door into, okay, it's about insecurities. Okay, it's about I was bullied in school. It's about my eating disorder. It's about whatever is bigger. You just acknowledge and accept that it's there. And I would recommend you to write it down, everything that comes up. And I would like for you to write it down where you don't add any judgment to what you're writing down. You just allow it, allow it to be there. Create space for it to be there. Acknowledge that it's there. Accept that it's there. Write it down. And don't do anything else. Don't intellectualize it. Don't start with there, there is no me, so there's no issue. Don't do that. There's been enough of that. It needs to end because a lot of people are identifying with not identifying. I mean, chew on that one. So it's important to acknowledge that there is an issue and accept that there is an issue. You need to own it before you can toss it. You can't throw away anything you don't own. You can only throw away when you own it. So in this phase, in the first five fetters, we pretend that there is an I and there is an issue because the delusion of an I and the delusion of an issue has created deep, deep scars in us. And you cannot just, you know, flick a wand and then you sort it out. You need to acknowledge accept and understand. And in the first three fetters, it's about, about that. A acknowledging that it's there, accepting that it's there, looking into what it is, but don't do anything. And then just understanding, okay, this one has roots. I mean, this is not just a, a shallow feeling that I have. This one has roots. This one has been repeated the last 25 years of my life. This one is dictating the partners I'm with. This one is dictating um, the, the choice of job that I have. This one has dictated whether I have children or haven't got children. This one has dictated basically everything in my life. 
So this one is a deep one, you know, this not deep in the sense of um, it being profound, but it just has very, very deep roots into emotions that we're not looking at yet. So right now, allow yourself to have the hundreds of rooms in the house. Allow yourself to walk around in the house. Take a look at all the doors. You don't need to open them yet, but just taking a look at it. Okay, there's an issue about about that friend that I had in the fifth grade that did the thing I don't want to talk about. And there's an issue about uh, my mom. And then there's the repeating issue with with my neighbors, no matter where I live. And there's, so you're just acknowledging all of the things being there. You're not doing anything. If you try to kick down the door and turn on the light, you're not going to achieve anything. Because your mind is protecting you. The ego is protecting you. We need to do what they in Japan call kaisen. So small steps. Small, small steps in the direction that you want to go. And the first step in that direction is acknowledgement. You just acknowledge. It's there. Don't want to look at it. I know it's there. At some point, by you just meeting yourself with compassion and meeting yourself with space to it being there, for some people, things dissolve just by that. And that's why it's so powerful for us to, whenever we we become aware of there being an issue, it's so powerful just creating space to it, opening up for the unconditional acceptance. And unconditional acceptance is when you acknowledge that there, there is an issue, there's a door, there is an issue. You acknowledge that. You might open the door and start to see that, okay, there are things in there that I cannot accept. I cannot accept that I have wasted my life with whatever. I cannot accept that. The unconditional acceptance is you accepting that you can't accept. A lot of times when there are things that we cannot accept, we just close the door shut and then pretend that that part of the house is, it doesn't exist. That doesn't solve anything at all. It's still there. Now it's just swept under the rock and, and that's it. There's a huge elephant in the room and that's it. It doesn't change the fact that it's still there. So unconditional acceptance is when you accept whatever comes up. Even if it's something you don't want to accept, it's fine, completely fine. Accept that you do not accept this. And that is the task for this lesson. There's some things that you easily can open the door into and go like, okay, I can accept and I can accept, I can't accept. Fine. Then you just leave it there. All the other things which you, you know, maybe put the door a little bit ajar, you know, okay, there was an issue about that thing when I was 30, you know, I don't want to talk about, there was an issue about that. So I acknowledge it's there. I accept that it's there, but I'm so not looking at it. Completely fine. We get to that. We get to that. It's completely fine. Remember that it's all about dissolving attachment. So when it feels like this is getting too much, it's a bit like when you do spring cleaning, you know, you take everything out and then you look around and go, oh my God, this looks so much worse than it did when everything was just tucked away neatly into cupboards. This is a bit the same. There's nothing coming up to the surface that is not already present. There's nothing that is being activated that isn't already there. But you don't need to push it. You don't need to be forceful about it. I mean, hatred solves nothing. Love is the only thing that can solve anything. So it's very important for you to have compassion towards yourself and compassion to whatever comes up. And then you just create space for what is. And by creating space, I mean allowing it to be there. If you have a wish about, you know, poking to it or looking into it, don't do that. You don't need to. It's going to resolve itself all by itself without you doing anything. It's going to completely resolve itself. And I know it might be complicated and difficult and you do not believe that is even possible. The thing when I was 30, that was horrendous. That is not going to dissolve all by itself. That's only where you're at now. That's only where you're at now. If you think about the biggest issue you had when you were 15, right? Did that issue solve itself? Of course it did. 
course it did. Because you got you got time and experience and maturity into it. This is the same. This is the same. But by putting a lid on it, it is never going to be dissolved at all. It can only be dissolved by you and by you acknowledging, accepting, and then understanding will follow. It will follow. It's like it's like a tide. You know, it will happen. You don't need to do anything. Just com- be compassionate towards what comes up. Create space towards co- what comes up. And then also um, have love towards co- what comes up. And I know that for a lot of people, I'm going to sound like, you know, a whole my bumper sticker. And, and it's not meant like that. But it, it really is that with love, there's a complete acceptance of what is. When you love people, you completely accept them as they are. You have no wish for them to be any different. And it's the same with you. If you really love, if you really have love, no matter what comes up, it's okay. It's completely okay. And if you right now sit and have like, okay, I don't have that. I want everybody to be different. I want everything to be different. Then... It's another topic that we're going to talk about today. The last thing I would like to say about compassion and why it's so important. It is that if you really think about it, the the issue that that you are thinking of right now, when it happened, if there had been compassion towards what happened, towards you when it happened, towards the situation, if there had been someone beside you, and just sitting and being, loving you and creating space for the experience that you had, then that experience would never have been, have turned into that very deep rooted pain that it is right now. So it's kind of like an indication to you that because it didn't happen then, it is what is needed now. You need to create space. You need to have compassion towards yourself in the way that that was that didn't happen then. So you need to be your own loving mother and protecting father. If you didn't have that, then be that now. And then I just again want to say you cannot force anything to happen. Nothing good happens with force. It doesn't. Force is a very, very contracting energy. We need expansion here. The only way to dissolve, to to untie a knot, is expansion. It's not, you know, pulling even harder. It's just expanding. So create space with compassion and love and see what, what happens, what dissolves all by itself. So this is what I call the healing ground. When you are with what is, without judging, and you have an acknowledgement, acceptance, and understanding, you create space for what is, there's compassion towards what is, that is the healing ground. And it also puts you in a position where where you start to get an inkling about that you cannot judge anything as good or bad. There's not any situation that is a good situation or bad situation. There's only assumptions and judgment about a situation to say whether it's a good or bad thing. In itself, it's not. Because think about it, who would have known that the things that you have been through in your life that is leading you to this point right now was actually the things that you needed to attain your freedom? Who knew? Here you were, 15 years old, 30 years old, things happened that you really, really thought when you went it was horrendous. You got cancer, you lost a child, I don't know what happened, but really, really big things where... When you're in it, you cannot imagine how you will ever, ever get over this, how you will ever survive this. And in the moment, if you had had a wand, you would have winked it and it wouldn't have happened. But that was part of the maturing process that leads you to this point where you're on a path with the federal work to achieve your freedom. Who knew? Who knew? And that being humble to reality in that sense, to to presence in that sense. That's the healing ground, because it also puts you in a place where who are you to know what Smith needs to do to attain their freedom? Who are you to know? Who are you to know what 
decision another person needs to make to attain your freedom. It might not be what you think they should do, but clearly they're doing it. You know, you're not in the equation. It's their life. You know, you're selfing. You can just pack up, pack it away. Not needed, not needed. Back to the healing ground, you know, create space. Whatever Smith is doing in their lives is completely fine. Completely fine. It's got nothing to do with you. And your opinions about it, completely irrelevant. Your assumption about what's going to happen if they do or don't do what they're going to do or don't do. Your assumptions about that, not relevant at all. Not relevant at all. That is selfing. That is you right now really, really honestly believing that you know better than they do. Well, did anybody know what happened to you would have been what you needed to achieve your freedom? No, of course not. Of course not. It's arrogance to believe that we know better than reality. You know, arguing with reality, that's so arrogant. Clearly, Smith knows what is best for them because they're doing it. They're doing it. You can't argue with that. It is as it is. So what you do, what, what, what is your ball game? What, what, is, what, what is your job while you're here is to create the healing ground for you. What is the healing ground? First of all, in the healing ground is no selfing. Believing that there is an I that, that has an opinion, I'm entitled to that opinion. That's so, so delusional. There's no I. There's no one to self with. It's just... Thoughts that are thinking, creating scenarios in the thoughts about what it's thinking. It's like me, myself and I. You're revolving around yourself, only about yourself, only about yourself. Get into the space where you acknowledge, ah, Smith is now making a decision I would not make. Is it my business? No, it's not. Do I have anything to do with that? No, I don't. I don't. Is there anybody here that knows better than reality. Mm -mm. No, clearly not. Reality is what is happening. Expectations is what is making you believe that something else than reality could and should happen. But that's mind made. It's not reality. Whenever you get that urge <laughs> to self, you get that urge to tell Smith off or direct Smith in the right path or Come with good advice or whatever. And go for a walk. Go for a walk. Be quiet. Just be quiet. And go for a walk. And when you go for the walk, then I would like for you to have your awareness on the assumption that we have when we go for a walk. I'm taking one foot in front of the other, putting it down to the ground. I would like for you to do the reverse. To see if you can pick apart that assumption. And instead, when you go for a walk, it's the ground that is going up and meeting your feet. So it's not a you pushing the foot down. It's a, the earth going up, meeting your feet. It's all about assumptions. I mean, you go, you going for a walk, assuming how it is to go for a walk. It's just assumptions. What? So the same thing that we're doing with this exercise is also just assumptions. It's just for you to look at things with a different perspective. Uh, looking with the perspective that you do not hold the key and the answers to everything. You really don't. It's a delusion when you believe so. There's no, you, you, haven't, you haven't got any opinion at all. That's correct. I hope you understood that last time we talked about it. So go for the walk. Feel how, how the ground is meeting your feet. Instead of you putting a foot down on the ground, feel how the ground is meeting your feet. See if you can connect with, with nature. And whether it's about you looking at the blue sky and just sitting and connecting with the clouds moving, See if you can breathe in the clouds. I mean, it is the same air that you're breathing, inhaling and exhaling as where the clouds are. So you can sit and breathe in the sky. And if you don't think you can, then why? Why do you assume that you can't? And just sit and notice nature. Hug a tree. Yeah, become a tree hugger. Hug a tree. Put your arms around the tree and then breathe with the tree. See if you can feel the, the, the tree breathing. Instead of is you hugging the tree, can you feel the tree hugging you? It's just about changing 
that um, single line assumption that we have that has the starting point in the selfing and then things are occurring around the selfing. It's just turning that upside down. You know, look at it the other way around. Um, and there's nothing deeper in it than that. We get to the deeper part later. This is just for you to really, really question your assumptions of the selfing. And that leads me to the next part of it. Let me ask you this. Can you ever be waiting? Sit and think about it for a second. Look into it. Can you ever be waiting? You might say, yes, I can. I'm sitting and waiting for a friend to meet up. I'm waiting. Well, are you? Are you really? That's what we're going to talk about right now because we're talking about expectations. How much of your life is tied in with expectations? Because expectations is when you put the selfing in the middle and you are expecting something to happen. So something will pan out. If I do this, that will happen. If I make an appointment, they will be on time. If I apply to this job, I will get the job. If I am wooing this person, they will fall in love with me. If I, we have expectations. Um, if I try to become pregnant, I will get a child. There's so many expectations that we have and all of them are tied in with selfing. And it's about the selfing believes that it can dictate reality. Obviously, that's ego, you know. As you remember, I talked about the ego having the I am not, I should be mentality. This is a part of it. Because the expectations, having a, a decision about how something or someone should do something is a very, very insecure ego trying to control reality and trying to control other people. There's no space for reality to be happening as it does. No space for that. I am so disappointed that this happened. I'm so disappointed that the train was canceled and I missed my appointment. So disappointed about that. That is selfing. You really honestly believe that just because you plan to take a train, that the train would be driving. All the things that need to fall into place for that to happen, the the, the people working on the railway, they were all of them were healthy and, and happy and going to work. There are so many things tied into you making that train, you know, getting the train when it was supposed to leave, for that train to leave. And the selfing does not look into that. The selfing is like <laughs> sitting like a little prince or little princess, wanting everything to fall into place around them and being so angry and frustrated and disappointed when that doesn't happen. Sometimes to, to make it more clear to you, then it helps when you, when, when something is happening and you become aware, okay, I had expectations that clearly were not met. I cannot unhook that. I'm so disappointed. I'm so disappointed. Then it helps making yourself into that whiny little toddler that you are. Yeah, sorry, said it. That whiny little toddler that you are. Ah, I wanted the train to leave. You know, over-exaggerated. Make that whiny little toddler voice. And then you might snap out of it. Then you might hear, ah, I wanted them to be on time. And then you can hear, oh my God, oh my God, I'm an adult human being and I'm sitting and trying to dictate how other people should act. Seriously? I'm acting like a whiny toddler. And you are, you are. Because the selfing honestly believes that I am in the right. Parents should love their children. Well, do they? Do they? No, they don't. A lot of parents do not love their children. A lot of parents are not even taking care of their children. So you having an assumption of that being right is actually in opposition to reality. Reality is that a lot of children are not cared for. They're not even wished. They're not wanted. They're, they're a, a outcasts. They're pushed out. And if the parents, the, the adults could be without them, the parents would be happy. That is reality. It's painful. It's so painful. And it's horrendous when you see it in the news or you or you see, you know, advertisement for third world country or anything like that. War-torn areas, refugee camps. It's it is heartbreaking when you see it. But my friend, that's reality. 
you not wanting it to be like that, you saying, but parents should love their children, is only telling something about your assumption. It's not saying anything about reality. Reality is that parents should not love their children because parents are not loving their children. Some are. Some are great parents. Some are not. Some are horrendous parents. That is reality. It's not good or bad. It just is. They should not treat me like that. Well, they are. They are. Right now you're selfing, deciding how other people should do in their lives for them to achieve their freedom. If their freedom is achieved by treating you like they're treating you, well, then they should do what they're doing. Clearly, they are doing what they're doing. You're the only one in a position to reality. You cannot mention an act that any human being has done when that when they did it, they were not 100% sure that this is the right thing to do. If they weren't, they wouldn't have done it. We did it because we were motivated to do it. And any person can be motivated to do whatever. We know that from concentration camps. We know that from genocides. We know that from, uh, yeah, office arguments and, and gossip. I mean, read the comment section, not not so much on my channel, but go on Facebook, read the comment section. Any person can be motivated to do and say anything, you know? That's reality. And it's nasty and it's disgusting and it's ugly and it's, yeah, it is. It is. Looking at a at, at live feed from a savannah, it's brutal. It's bloody brutal. That's life trafficking of children and women and it's brutal but it's reality it's reality having expectations for reality to be to be different than it is having the wish for reality to be like hallmark that's a protection mechanism and i i'm i'm sending you love i really really am and i would like for you to have equally much love for the parts of you that need reality to be like Hallmark, you know, a Disney movie. I really, I'm sending you so much love and so much compassion. I'm, I'm creating space for the pain that you clearly have experienced. And I will really urge you to do the same, you know, enter the house. Look, acknowledge there is a door. I'm so not opening that door. <laughs> The door that goes into human trafficking, I'm not opening that door. I cannot deal with that. Don't. You don't have to. It was what I said in the beginning. You don't have to deal with it. The only thing that you have to do is acknowledge that it's there. You don't need to do anything. So to circle back to the part about expectations. Expectations is you placing the self in the middle and really honestly believe that you can dictate reality and you get disappointed when reality is just reality. When things happen as things clearly were supposed to happen. You save and save and save and save and then you buy a house and then the market crash. That's reality. You can be super, super, super sad about it. You have collected a beautiful home and it all burns down. You had the expectation that everything in the beautiful home that you collected would stay like that forever. If you read on my homepage, I'm, t I'm talking about this on the homepage. I talk about that it's, it's one of the three impossibles. We so want things to be permanent, predictable and permanent. <laughs> it never is. Never, never is. If you look back on your life, you have an expectation of it going like that. You know, a smooth ride all the way. Well, the majority of people that have a life going like that, you know. It never, ever works out the way that you want. And that is life. It's not supposed to work out like you want. It's supposed to work out clearly like it works out. Clearly. That's reality. Expectation is everything, every time you get disappointed about something. That's expectation. If you're still with me, then you're ready for the next step. And the next step <laughs> is a super nasty one to discover and to realize. And the thing is, as soon as I have said it, it is planting a little seed in the back of your mind and you can never, ever 
get that seed away. So if you want to stop, then stop right now. Expectations are tied in to victimhood. You see yourself as a victim. And now you go, no, I don't. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Why does this happen to me? Why are you acting like that? Oh, don't want it like that. As I said, expectations are tied into victimhood. And if you really breathe, take a paper bag, breathe in it, breathe in it, you know, calm down, calm down. Yes, 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 I know, I know, I know. It's really difficult to hear. Whenever you have expectations and you get disappointed, you're acting like a victim. You're acting like this should not have happened. You know, why did this happen? How could you do that, this to me? You always do like that. I never, ever. And those examples that I just gave you are verbal indicators for expectations. The verbal indicators for an identification tied into expectation. Be aware of those. Write them down and be aware of them. You don't need, as I said, in the first fetter, you don't need to change anything. Not at all. You just need to acknowledge this is how it is. So whenever you use one of the verbal indicators, it's just for you to have kind of like, you know, little light bulb <laughs> switching on going like, oh, oh, this is a verbal indicator. Right now, I'm expecting something. Ah, right now, I'm a victim. How am I a victim? Oh, I'm a victim because I expect them to do differently. I expect them to react differently. I expect to do this and expect them to do that. They didn't. Now I'm disappointed. Ah, I'm, I'm a whiny little toddler. The verbal indicators, they're more. And I'm going to give you more when we get to uh, the end of the third fetter and the beginning of the fourth and the fifth fetter. Right now, the verbal indicators for expectations are the ones that I would like for you to be aware of. I would like for you to pay attention to what part of you are acting out from victimhood. What part of you are acting as if something should not have happened and because it happened, you are a victim. If it hadn't happened, you wouldn't have been a victim. But that is you projecting a lot into other people. You know, they are not allowed to be who they are. Smith are not allowed to be as they are. They're supposed to be in a certain way, do a certain thing, give you a gift that is equal to the gift you gave them. Otherwise, you get disappointed. And believing that Smith are in the wrong for doing as they do is placing you in victimhood. Are you? Seriously? Are you a victim? Seriously? People are allowed to be who they are, clearly, because they are. You are allowed to be who you are. You are allowed to end this lesson right now and go like, I don't believe any of that. I don't believe any of it. All that federal work, non-duality, nonsense, none of it is correct. Absolutely. Of course, I'm entitled to have expectations of what is happening. Of course, I'm entitled to that. Great. Great. See you in 10 years. Because you will get back to this. And at some point, you're going to realize that, that the selfing that you're doing is delusional. There is no self. You are not in the middle of Smith's attention. You're not. And you're not supposed to be. It is only mind-created issues. It's not real. So now I would like for you to look at all the things you would like to achieve. Make a list. All of the things you would like to achieve. All of, all of you out there that are making one-year plans and five-year plans and ten-year plans, write it down. You probably <laughs> just need to take out a sheet because you have already written it down. You might have a mind map hanging on the wall. All of that that you really, really want to happen. You really, really want to achieve that. I would like for you to look at that. Write it all down. I would now like for you to pay attention to why you want it to happen. Because for everything you want to happen, there's a why attached to it. There's an expectation to something happening when that happens. So let's say you want to lose the famous 10 pounds, 5 kilos. What do you expect is going to happen when that has happened? Do you expect to be calm, content, more confident, happier, desired, wanted? What do you expect is going to happen? We're talking about gravity has on your biological being. Do you really, really expect that when that change, you're going to be happy? Seriously? So write down all your expectations, everything you want to achieve and why you want to achieve it. And now let me ask you, if you look at the list of all the things you have written down, everything you would like to achieve, if none of that is happening, 
if the why is not going to happen, will you still be content? If you then lose the 10 pounds, the 5 kilos, and you're not happy, and you're not desired, and you don't feel comfortable, are you then going to be content? Of course you're not. Of course you're not. Because it's tied into selfing that is tied into expectation. This is a great one. You might meditate because you want to become awake. My best advice to you, stop meditating. Stop meditating. You know, you're completely delusional if you think that bringing calm is going to achieve something. Then it's not about the bringing calm anymore. It's about the achievement. You're not doing it because it's lovely to meditate. You're doing it because you want something. That is tied into selfing. And I can tell you right now, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Whatever the selfing want is never going to happen. Because the selfing is never content. It's like the seeker will always seek. The seeker is never going to find. Just like expectations are never going to be fulfilled. There's always going to be more. And all of you out there that have done magnificent things in your life, that have made mind maps, made lists, and you um, did, you ticked everything, every single thing on the list of things that you wanted to do, and you achieved all of it. Congratulations. What I'm talking about is, did you enjoy it? Was it enjoyable? Not achieving it, not ticking it off, but doing it. Because most people that have that urge to achieve, it's about acknowledgement. They need acknowledgement from other people. And it's not about achieving it. It's about when they can do like that on the list, they're not going to get punished. Usually the people that are high achievers like that, they have a history of childhood trauma where they were taught that they needed always to do better. And if they didn't do well enough, they were punished either physically or verbally or by being ignored. So therefore they became high achievers to avoid that, not to achieve. So every single achievement is a... Uh, Thank God I didn't get punished. It's not about yay at all. The underlying negative motivation is that you're not going to get punished. If you're a high achiever and you look back at all the things you have achieved in your life, I'm not dissing it. I'm not saying it's not good. Congratulations. It's amazing. What I would like for you to be aware of now and become aware of is the enjoyment in between. Did you have that? Or when you look at it, do you see that there wasn't really any enjoyment. It was just about the goal. You were about you were like a pit bull. You have your 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 jaws were clenched on the thing that you wanted. Nothing that happened in a different way you did not accept and you did not want. And even when you did the taking it off your list, there was never really a profound feeling of of achievement. Yes, so you got your PhD. Are you any happier? No, because it was never about that. It was never about that. It was never, you think it's about the happiness. You think it's about the why. You think it's about, I'm doing this because I would like. It's not about that. There's always an underlying emotion that is driving you, that is the, the driving force, and that is the negative driving force. We're going to look at that in the fourth and the fifth. I just want you right now to, to acknowledge that this is a thing in your life. There are trauma tied into you being a high achiever. There's trauma tied into being people pleaser, to always being uh, nice and, and positive and uh, doing good in the world. Um, because you want to do good or because you want people to be happy or because you want to relieve their suffering and, and relieve their pain, there, there's trauma tied into that. And I know now I'm going <laughs> to get bombarded by every single Bodhisattva and Buddhist practitioner out there. What I'm talking about is obviously not being kind out of, you know, generosity just happening. Um, you make lunch and you just make an extra portion and you bring it to the neighbor or you go to the street and give it to somebody who needs it and and don't ever tell anybody about it you just do it because you can that's not what i'm talking about but the, what i'm talking about is you bringing food to i have actually once had an participant that exp experienced that because i said the thing about you know make an extra portion go and bring it to another to a homeless person and, uh, and she did. And the homeless person looked and I went like, 
I don't like that. And she got so angry. She, she didn't say anything, but she got so angry that when we had the groom session, session next time, she was like, I'm so angry because he wasn't grateful. He was supposed to be grateful. I'm making food and bringing it to him and he's not grateful. So we had a talk about that. <laughs> so it's about becoming aware of the bloody ego, you know, the bloody selfing. It was never about feeding a homeless person. It wasn't about that. It was about me being great, me being great, you know, being able to tell all my friends about how great I am. It's one of the things, if you really, truly want to be kind towards other people, you cannot tell anybody about it. Not to, You can walk around town and you can give £10 notes to every single homeless person you meet and you're not telling anybody about it. You cannot say it to a soul. You cannot even write it down. If the action is forgotten, then it was a truly kind action because it wasn't about that. It wasn't about them being happy. It wasn't about other people saying that you're great or doing good in the world. All that it wasn't about that. It was about the instant payoff that you had in the moment when you did it. It felt right to do it and you did it and now it feels right again. You know, it's like when you really, really need to pee and you go and pee and you have that ah feeling. That's the feeling it should be when you're kind to other people. If, if, if that's not the feeling that you have, then look into if you have any kind of expectations into what should happen. So let me ask you again. Can you ever be waiting? Can you ever be waiting? Or is it just you sitting or standing and being? Is it just being? And somebody's going to turn up at some point. Or maybe they're not turning up at some point. You might have planned to go to the movies. Your friend doesn't show, so you miss the movies. Apparently we're not supposed to go to the movies today. Okay. Can you be content with anything? Whatever happens, you're content. If you can't, it's fine, completely fine. I'm going to circle back to this when we get to the second feta, to the third feta, and it's going to dissolve itself completely in the fourth and the fifth. So if you don't feel content right now, it's completely fine. It's completely fine. It was what I started by saying. There's nothing that you need to do. There's nothing that you need to learn. There's things that you need to detach from. You know, detach the attachment from. And that's it. What I would like for you to have awareness in from this lesson. It's first of all, look into your expectations. What expectations do you have when you do a task? Do you see how your expectations tie you into that self proclaimed victimhood? Do you see how you're making reality into a perpetrator? Would your goals lose any kind of meaning or would your goals change if they were not fulfilled? And I would also like to say if you become aware of childhood trauma and you need help, then reach out. You're not alone. We are almost 8 billion people on the planet. You're not alone. Reach out. If you were never ever to talk about any insight that you gain, would it lose its meaning? If you were never ever to talk about any good deed that you do, would it lose its meaning? What part of the I am not, I should be mentality do you recognize? Are you okay if you do all this and nothing change? It's not. It's not going to change. All the things you want to change are not changing. <laughs> and the last thing is, I would like for you to discover the thing about that every thought is about something. What is every thought that you have about? And is there an expectation tied into it? The thought that is about something, is it about the future or the past? Is it about an expectation? I would also like for you to write down all the things that you know that you have feelings about and that you know that you have emotions about. There's nothing you need to do about it. You just write it down. 
It's just for you to have an overview when, for when we get to it, then we're going to look at it. Right now, it's just about writing it down. So basically, entering the house, looking, acknowledging all the doors that are there. Just acknowledging that they're there. You don't need to open any of them. Just acknowledge that they're there. Write it down. Write it down, write it down. So it's about acknowledge, accept and understand. This lesson here is about acknowledging. And I think that was it. I think that was it. Make sure you speak with your guide. Make sure you reach out if you're in a group. I can warmly recommend you Vince group uh, on Sundays. Reach out in the group. If you have any questions, then just ask. There are beautiful people in there that are just waiting to talk with you. And what is beautiful about the groups is that space is created for you. Whatever comes up, it's okay. That was it. Thank you.